In this lecture on culture, cognition, and the environment, Dr. Michael Paliso presents an overview of the cognitive approach to understanding culture and its application to environmental challenges. He starts by noting that there are many definitions of culture and that the cognitive approach to understanding culture uses concepts like taxonomy, cultural domains, prototypes, cultural models, and cultural consensus to explain shared human decision-making and understanding. He uses the example of the Fisteria outbreak in the Chesapeake Bay as a research project to which these approaches have been applied, and he overviews the analytical tools used. He then uses a second example of farmer perceptions of land conservation to explain the cultural model methodology, which uses empirical data to build a schema that highlights shared understandings and motivations of farmers. He also uses the example of oyster restoration to elaborate on the culture as distributed knowledge approach, which seeks to characterize within group variation in cultural consensus and to identify the linkages among different cultural concepts. Finally, he discusses the opportunities and motivations in anthropology for linking culture, cognition, and the environment. I'm going to focus on a cognitive environmental approach and give you some uh, principles and as well as some show you some data and talk with you about what that produces. As I mentioned yesterday, I'm very interested in culture and uh, within our discipline of anthropology, culture, um, there are some people who don't problematize it and other people who critique it, other people who use it um, somewhat loosely and um, I'm very interested in using it quite specifically. But what strikes me about culture and studying culture is that if you look at these different images here, um, culture is being represented. Um, whether you go to Caribou Coffee and you know there's a and you read what their values are and what they want to share, you know we have a global culture that's diverse. We have this amazing photo of people getting on a train, being shoved in a train while the rest of them are waiting and. And somehow you might just think, well, that's cultural. And then you see the handshake and the bow down here um, in the lower right-hand corner. So what's fascinating about culture is that it, you know, we recognize it and it makes us realize that we can behave in very, very different ways. And somehow that's cultural. Um, not exclusively, but it's a major role. And I, I think it's an important area for our research. So I've put up here a list of definitions of culture. And um, I don't want to even want to hazard to guess how many definitions of culture there are in anthropology. Um, might equal how many definitions there are for sustainability or something like that. Um, but these are sort of the common ones that you hear that I would argue uh, people kind of think of when they think about culture. And you can read them. I'll just read uh, one of them. You know, culture, the integrated pattern of human knowledge, belief, and behavior that depends upon the ca capacity for learning and transmitting knowledge to succeeding generations. The second definition, the customary beliefs, social forms, material traits, cultures of a racial, religious, social group, um, et cetera, et cetera. Shared value. So uh, typically uh, we think of culture as something that is shared, um, something that is learned, uh, and and we it can include everything is culture, meet the, the culture, Italian culture, for example, or U.S. culture, or Mexican culture, and we can be very, very specific about it. Um, so it's not that useful, I think, to try to pin it down and define it um, at this general level. I don't know if at this, I think at this general level it's useful in public discourse and debates and discussions, and everyone I always say people know about culture, so when you say you study culture, they kind of look at you and say, yeah, but we already know everything about that, you know. Um, so um, I try to take a different approach. Now, I'm not interested in all of culture, but I'm interested in culture and nature. And I find this a fascinating topic. And if, here I put up four images that if you look at them, could convey to you different representations of what nature is. And while you look at that, I'll share with you my newest representation of nature, which emerged this morning as I was on the treadmill at the hotel next door, um, jogging, and, but I was actually um, in the Grand Canyon watching this screen in front of me, okay? And so I thought, oh, I definitely have to weave this into my talk today. <laughs> and so I pushed it a little bit. Okay, obviously, I know I'm on a treadmill, I'm sweating, I'm getting tired. Um, 
And uh, I'm following this trail through the Grand Canyon, and I notice other people are there and all of that. Um, but then I, I start thinking, okay, I know that I'm on a piece of technology that's creating this for me. Um, so I'm not really in nature or the natural world, uh, which I separate out. And then I began thinking about, I began connecting to it. So I realized when I used to run uh, quite, uh, marathons at a younger age, um, I ran the Marine Corps Marathon at just under nine minutes. So I don't know, I, I picked up the pace on the treadmill to get under nine minutes and it changed my relationship with nature at that moment. <laughs> I mean, it was a couple moments, you know, as we were going down, I was going down, you know, I began to get nervous. So it was quite a, um, it got more powerful after I kind of reflected on this screen about nature. So um, I make a point in my teaching and my research to, to use nature only when I'm talking about cultural representations of the natural world. And the natural world is a biophysical world out there through which um, I argue that we can't get to without putting on some cultural lenses. And so this morning on that treadmill, I had some cultural lenses on, bringing experiences. And I wasn't fooled. I knew I wasn't in the Grand Canyon. But um, I did have an experience with the natural world through an emer you know, a very dynamic concept of culture, which I was able to incorporate the treadmill into. So um, I'm interested in culture, uh, but I want to be very, very specific about uh, the approach I take to culture. And so I take a cognitive approach. And we heard this definition yesterday. It was uh, associated with Conklin and Conklin's work. But an anthropologist, Ward Goodenough, late in the 1950s, came up with a definition for, of culture that could be used from a cognitive approach. And I'll read it. And it's, um, it says, a society's culture consists of whatever one has to know or believe in order to operate in a manner acceptable to its members and do so in any role that they would accept for any one of themselves. So all of a sudden, culture, by taking this approach, I'm very much narrowing the look at culture down to what is it that you have to know in order to behave in a way that is generally appropriate to, to those around you. So right now we are sharing culture. We are all behaving very appropriately in these roles. You're sitting there, you're taking notes, you're, um, I'm trying to be coherent and clear. Um, and throughout this entire workshop, We've been behaving in ways that indicate that we, ha we share the knowledge we need to know in order to behave in a way that's appropriate for this type of setting, this type of group. And what's fascinating to me to think about is that we never met before, and yet uh, we're able to follow these rules quite quick, easily, without even thinking about them. We don't even question them. But if Olaf all of a sudden stood up and bumped me over, and wanted to take over my lecture, I obviously would let him, but um, <laughs> that could be uh, perceived as inappropriate behavior by all of you without, or appropriate, no, inappropriate without, um, without even acknowledging it verbally. So I'm interested in that knowledge that uh, people have in their head that is shared in order that allows them to behave in appropriate ways. So you use that cognitively stored knowledge a million times a day to get through the day. How to open a door, close a door, how to cross a street, how to recognize a driver that may be unsafe, how to recognize a person that is behaving inappropriately and not in very, very subtle, nuanced ways. There's a tremendous amount of knowledge. So it places culture squarely within the knowledge and belief systems. So I'm not talking about culture, material culture. I'm not talking so much about behavior, social institutions, etc. Obviously, it's related to that. Um, but I'm really interested in knowledge and values. That's the way that I phrase it, knowledge and values. Um, and no, and I, I believe beliefs, beliefs are a form of knowledge, so I, I find it easier just to say knowledge and values. And that requires that we um, discover domains, content, organizations. How is that knowledge that you have to behave the way you are behaving in this room. How is that organized? How did you get it? How do you share it? How, do you, how does it change? Um, 
So it redefines a cultural group. We talked about multi-sided yesterday. I mean, we came from different places. We came from different backgrounds. Um, we're, and we're, um, we're not trying to understand the culture of the natural sciences or something. We're only trying to understand the culture that's present in this group um, currently. And so it, so it redefines cultural group as if we share this culture, then we met, recognize that we belong to this group. And we belong to this group of postdocs and anthropologists that are right now working, discussing on some issues and interacting. In anthropology, there, uh, and there are five, at least five major sort of cognitive anthropological approaches. And um, I'll be brief. And all of these have been applied to uh, environment. So yesterday, um, I think Eduardo mentioned ethnobiology, ethnoscience, the first one where anthropologists have tried to figure out what is the um, usually indigenous knowledge uh, that is used to organize knowledge about a particular domain, whether that be plant, animals, firewood, et cetera. So um, what are the underlying organizing principles? And the famous example is firewood, you know, so we have firewood, which is like one term, but uh, most indigenous groups have six or seven, eight different terms for firewood based on some underlying characteristics, qualities that they find very useful to them to differentiate the, and create a taxonomy of what firewood is. Cultural domains, um, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute in that there's maybe some broader domains. So I'm interested in a very complex cultural domain of, of um, resilience, vulnerability, <clears throat> even climate change. Um, I've been interested in domains about, can be interested in a cultural domain about the particular fruit that Eduardo talked about. You know, you can really um, explore how does knowledge and values about that um, disperse horizontally, vertically, etc. And in all of these cognitive approaches, and here I, I want to mention Paige's work, you know, there, you can look at power and dynamics and kind of more inductively. Um, so I don't, I see this as complementary to political ecology and, and uh, certainly uh, in the cognitive work, power and structure and agency come up. Prototypes is another approach that we've used. A simple, uh, I'm not going to talk about that, but a simple example is using a, a form, a focal representative. So, um, a penguin is not a good prototype for birds, for example, you know, or a certain fish, this striped bass out here on the wall, is a good prototype for a type of like recreational trophy fish, for example. So where you, you choose like a normative good example and analyze the features of it. And the two that I'm going to talk about today, the, the other two, is cultural models and cultural consensus. So uh, cultural models are presupposed, taken for granted models of the world that are widely shared by the members of society and that play an enormous role in their understanding of the world and their behavior in it. So I'm going to, um, very, very consistent with the cognitive definition that I talked about earlier, um, but it's looking at, we actually have these cognitive models to explain um, what is a good cup of coffee. That's kind of my favorite example, you know, that... Uh, and we don't we and the, we don't articulate it enough. But if an anthropologist studied Starbucks, and they were a cognitive anthropologist, they would really come up with what is a good cup of coffee. And it's changed tremendously today, and and that's interesting and fascinating. But it's not un unrelated to how the role of coffee in our consumption and society and our social networks has changed. And then finally, uh, cultural consensus, and that's a quantitative approach that has some different um, ontologies underneath it. It assumes that if individuals have similar views and understandings, that they share some underlying system of cultural knowledge. So just to repeat, there's kind of five approaches that have been used in cognitive anthropology, the main ones. All of them have been applied to environmental research over the last um, couple of decades, uh, and I'll talk about three of them. So let me start off with the first of, of the three, which is cultural domain analysis. And I'm going to give an example here. So um, back in around 2000, late 1999, 1998, on the Chesapeake Bay, there was a harmful algal bloom called Fisteria. This coincided um, with my arrival at the University of Maryland. And I, and I arrived there 
and had previously only worked internationally, and I'd been working in Honduras. And, um, and I, it was late summer, there was this harmful algal bloom, it was called Fisteria, and it went wild in the press. And it got picked up by the public, and people were hysteric about it, and people were, uh, became a household word. It was also it happened during a low news cycle, it was August, uh, you know, and um, it, I was so impressed with how cultural it went so quickly and in such a complicated way. It was also an election year. So um, Fisteria, um, one of its effects is it can cause lesions on Menhaden. And, this, and it was, could also cause, we, we thought, um, short-term memory pro, um, problems with commercial fishermen. So this was beginning to build a narrative that people were grabbing onto. People stopped eating seafood you know, around the region, whether it came from the Chesapeake Bay or not, it happened in a very, very localized area. So there was all this hysteria around Fisteria, and they started calling it the cell from hell, um, etc. And it was, it was wonderfully rich for a new anthropologist in the area. And, and that was my, um, uh, one of my turns that I decided, okay, maybe we should study this. Interestingly, I'd come from a nonprofit where when we saw a good research topic, we just jumped on it. So it wasn't a good, it was a good tenure track move in hindsight, but it did give my advisor like some sleepless nights that I was leaving Honduras to start a whole new research project on the Chesapeake Bay, and I would need to come up for tenure within six years. Okay, so um, Fisteria was really great. And it had some political influences because um, environmental groups, and I'll overstate this with apologies, um, used the um, Fisteria was perhaps linked to uh, excess nitrogen in the water, and that was from agricultural runoff. And prior to this, uh, prior to Fisteria, Maryland had voluntary nutrient management plans by farmers. Um, this allowed or facilitated, made easier, the push to have sort of mandatory nutrient management plans on farmers at the state level. Um, which has you know, been good and bad and controversial, et cetera. And so what we were interested, myself and some students, um, how did farmers and environmentalists, how did they come to understand Fisteria? You know, were they so different and all of that? So a great, great you know, anthropological problem. So, um, so did they really view Fisteria similarly or differently? That was our question. So one of the tricks, tricks, I said it, tools we used um, was a free listing. So in order to try to not quote it, bias and be as inductive and, and step back, we simply asked people to list the words that come to their mind when they hear the word fisteria. And um, so people, we got these long lists, et cetera, um, but 19 terms were, had high salience, whether they were repeated with some frequency or they were repeated early on in the list, higher than lower. And these are the terms that came out, chicken houses, environmentalists. Chicken houses on the Maryland Eastern Shore was, is the orig origin of industrialized poultry production, and manure is used to fertilize. Manure is high, uh, particularly in phosphorus, but also ex nitrogen. Um, so manure was being applied. So chicken houses, environmentalists, fish kills, development, farmers, government, economic impact, health impact, manure, uh, media, nutrients, politics, pollution, poultry industry, regulations, research, sewage, water quality, and watermen. So these were the 19 terms that, that we filtered out of our free listing with a sample of environmental professionals and, and farmers. What did we do next? We created a triadic comparison exercise. Um, and in this exercise, if you take that first row of sewage, media, and research, your task is to circle the one word that is least similar to the other two. So what I'm looking for is similarities and differences. So anyone just say, sewage, good answer. <laughs> so sewage, you circle out. Um, but some people might not circle, they might circle out research, because they think the media is sewage, you know? <laughs> and, um, or farmers, nutrients, and government. Um, you know, nutrients, okay? So the point is that we get, we pick up some variability in what people are saying. And our goal is to, for this domain of Fisteria, which is uh, quite a big domain, can we tease out any sort of uh, patterns in what people see as similar and different. So this is a very effective um, exercise to do. You can do it really quickly and it produces um, some results.
that look um, scientific. <laughs> I'm hedging my bets here. So um, this is a, a, a very fun thing to do with um, nominal data uh, that's been collected from free listing pile sorts, paired comparisons, some other things that we've used. And um, this is a two-dimensional plot, multi-dimensional scaling. Um, it's called correspondence analysis where we take the individual responses and we plot them in a two or three dimensional space and see how they cluster. Now terms that are closer together mean that people saw them as more similar. So in the bottom right hand corner you see poultry industry, farmers, and chicken houses. You know, kind of makes, makes sense. And in the upper right hand corner you see sewage, water quality, pollution, fish kills, etc. Um, and in the middle you see research, regulations, environmentalists. And in these um, oval circles there um, you see the variability between environmentalists and farmers responses and the, the plus sign, the cross in the middle is like the, the, the midpoint or the, you know, the, if we combine the two of them, that would be the, where the term would plot. So this allows us to kind of see that in fact in a, the underlying cultural domain, farmers and environmentalists are not that different in terms of how they're uh, uh, drawing upon cultural information to understand Fisteria, which was counter to the discourse that was uh, in, the, in the media at the time which indicated that farmers and um, environmental professionals were locking head. That doesn't mean that they weren't at, in opposition, because there are some political and economic factors here, but that, um, that those disagreements that they were coming up with, they were drawing upon some shared, more shared underlying um, information than we might have thought before. That doesn't mean they don't disagree on things. And that you notice things like media, politics, and government are out here to the bottom left and by themselves, which means people couldn't consistently know where to place those terms. Okay. So we use these plots to analyze, to um, interpret, but also to bring back for more conversations. Now, since it was plotted in two-dimensional space and multi-dimensional theory organized the, the terms um, based upon two dimensions, you get to hypothesize, you get to interpret what those dimensions might be. So we're kind of moving down below the explicit responses to some underlying dimensions. So you'll see an arrow there that says outside to inside, causes versus consequences. So you could interpret this and we, you could come up with some others as well, but you only get two because it was plotted in two-dimensional space. So this is a first attempt to maybe suggest that even below the explicit agreement and disagreement, there are some underlying themes that people are using to organize these terms. They're organizing on things that are local or regional that happen within their area or things that come from outside, the local versus non-local, causes versus consequence. And these arrows can go in diagonally as well. So it's um, interpretive, anal it's uh, analytical, these, this stress to be val or this plot in order to be valid, it has to um, be plotted spatially very similarly to the um, correlations in the agreements and disagreements that you'd have in a basic numerical table. So there's a stress to this plot and if you get too much stress then you can't trust the validity of the visual. So that's a, a very easy sort of cognitive environmental approach that we take. And uh, we've, we've done one on climate change with African-American populations uh, recently and just came out in Nature Climate Change. And um, very, very uh, useful to look at vulnerabilities and adaptation and, and the terms that they gave us and how they clustered and were very insightful in terms of looking at socioecological systems and governance issues. Okay. So um, that's very easy work to do, the free listing pile sorting. Um, uh, multi-dimensional scaling. Um, it to, another approach is to use cultural modeling. And um, so this is similar. So I have these two photos up here. You know, again, 
uh, sort of stereotypically, uh, we might think of, oh, you know, the culture of a particular indigenous group. This is not Highland New Guinea page. I just want to be clear about that. No, okay. But really, uh, I'm kind of uh, pushing to and over pushing to make an argument that culture is in the mind. And I do that with great trepidation, but I find it kind of useful to go out on a limb on that. And so, um, so again, we get the definition that culture is, uh, is what one has to know or believe in order to operate in a manner acceptable to, to, uh, to its members, to others. Um, doesn't mean everyone operates the same, okay? Um, cultural mo models are these presupposed, taken for granted um, understandings of the world. Um, they're comprised of interconnected schemas. Schemas are um, cognitive templates that get filled in with information uh, that you use to build uh, models. And these can be processed cognitively very, very quickly. So um, you see uh, some food and you already kind of know if you like it or don't like it, or if it's recognizable to or not. Or if, you know, so you're constantly using this schematic, cognitively stored information to make these decisions. Not too revolutionary there, but um, it's interesting that uh, now with the cognitive sciences uh, going s uh, very, very quickly and, and um, extensively into neuroimaging and relating that to a lot of behaviors and practices, um, that uh, this cognitive stuff is, is not unrelated to that. And there's even a new emerging field in anthropology called neuroanthropology. Um, this last point is important is that, and this is what intrigued me the most about this approach. And, and I should say, before I came to Maryland, I was a behavioralist. I studied people's allocation of time. Um, and I made a very huge jump over to the cognitive side. Um, and I don't know if it was triggered by hysteria, part of the hysteria or not. <laughs> but it happened at the same time. So, but it, it, what strikes me is that in new and uncertain environmental situations, your reasoning draws more heavily on cultural models. So we're facing new and environmental situations. Climate change is a great one. Um, but fisheries, all of the environmental issues that we face, we don't have exhaustive data to tell us which is right or wrong. And so um, the, the, they're messy problems, they're wicked problems. Um, I'm very interested in what is the existing cognitive knowledge that people draw upon to understand those problems. They have that knowledge present even as they come to a workshop like this. So the postdocs here, the anthropologists here, we have a lot of cognitively stored knowledge about our expertise that is present in the room. And I we saw it yesterday in, in the questions that were asked. And I, I think I speak for all the anthropologists. We felt, wow, this is pretty intense. You know, we don't ask these questions of ourselves that much. Um, so I'm very interested in these environmental si situations where um, that cognitive knowledge is used initially, maybe will still be resident and present as discussions, collaborations, engagements go on, and how it kind of changes over time. So how to, how to build these cultural models? I should say I make a point of, they are models in my, in my view and in others. Um, they're qualitative models. Um, and uh, I've had numerous discussions with colleagues across a wide range of disciplines about what are models? We've never resolved that. And, um, but I do believe that qualitative models qualify. They don't have to be always quantitative. Um, so the semi-structured interviews that I talked about yesterday to uh, simulate that natural discourse. And Paige talked about discourse. And, that, and discourse is such an important concept that it's more than just information to sharing. It's actually creating meaning, et cetera, as as uh, knowledge is deployed and knowledge is used. So I mentioned that in the Fisteria um, uh, scare, uh, environmentalists push through new state regulations for nutrient management, um, regulatory management. The, um, and we see this happening on the Chesapeake Bay and in our recent efforts in TMDLs and WIPs, et cetera. 
Um, so this, you know, we can stimulate with this semi-structured interviews, we can get natural discourse, we can transcribe them, we have these text analysis software that can allow us to manage 3,000 pages of field notes and pull out themes and organize themes on that text analysis model that I showed yesterday. Um, we, but that's just technique. We have some theories about how to go through the data. Um, I like to build a logical model first. A logical model or framework is on climate change, you know, climate is changing, it's impacting something, there's an outcome, uh, an output, and finally there's a response. So these four categories, I first kind of code whatever fits into those logical categories and then we can recode by taking all the, the coded text that comes under those four large categories and pile sorting them into piles where we put these things in this pile because they're more similar than that pile, than that pile, than this pile. We then name those piles and that becomes our second level of coding, etc. cetera. Um, and then I showed you how we can build these code networks to kind of get a visual representation of text data. Um, so uh, then we build a cultural model from that. And um, the fundamental thing here is, and this is a farmer uh, cultural model of what farmers think of when you say land conservation. And so we had all of these processes that I talked about and um, we, had, we had this text all coded and then the next qualitative ethnographic question drawing upon your participant observation and it's the most important part and the most difficult is what is it that they have to, to know in order to make all these statements that we've now put into categories. So we're moving from the explicit, what people to told us, we've coded it into categories, and we ask then this one next step, which makes it cognitive. You know, what, what do we think they need to know in order to make that statement? Okay. And so we then, and that creates schemas around like, what is an easement, a, a land easement? You know, what is profitable agriculture? What is farmland and rural landscape? So this, there's a lot of text that goes with this model, but here's a simple schematic of it. So in the Chesapeake, around this area, um, farmers are involved in a lot of land conservation. We have land trust programs um, that are um, trying to put a lot of land into conservation easements to stop development, slow down development, particularly in vulnerable, um, biodiverse, valuable areas. Um, and so their fundamental tool to do that is to put uh, farmland into conservation easements. And these conservation eas easements are in, in perpetuity. So a farmer will sign a, an agreement to take this land here and put it in a conservation easement. He or she can no longer farm that land, okay? Well, they can farm the land, but they can never sell the land. They could never sell it to a developer, okay? So the fundamental tool approach by the conservationists is to use, to take easements and take farmland out of product, take farmland and make sure it never goes into um, to buildings development, okay? And it's a very rational and good approach and, and farmers use it. But farmers um, understand easements and they see easements as an important tool, but they have a, a more complex model of it, which is, different than the conservationists. And so farmers say, you know, it starts off from a very different point. They start off from the land. Yeah, that you want to preserve land for its best use. All lands have different types of uses, okay? And there's some land that should be put into an easement. But please, please, please don't put good cropland into an easement. And nothing um, upsets a farmer more than to grow houses on good cropland and then call it White Gate Farm. It's just unbelievable how upsetting they can, you know, that's not a farm, you know, but, you know, they, they use the word grow houses and they also, they don't say raising chickens, they say grow chickens. They're growing chickens. So you take their model implicitly, tacitly, and no farmer ever said this to us in our work, 
was that you preserve land for its best use. If you do that and you bring in easements, like you have some land that you can't plant, put that in an easement and get uh, some money from it and a break on your taxes each year. The conservation here is soil conservation. Um, all of these three things will make agriculture profitable. If you make agriculture profitable, you'll keep land in farmland. If you keep land in farmland, you'll have a nice rural landscape. It's a very different implicit tacit understanding about how, how all this works. And um, they're using the same terms as the um, conservationists. So it's a good example of trying to what is the knowledge that's resident behind them when, they t when they're sitting there and you're trying to sell them on an easement. Um, finally, uh, a third approach is cultural consensus. And um, this is, again, uh, some people call it cultural models, and that's fine. Uh, I kind of separate cultural models, more qualitative versus consensus. And this has a, a, a different um, ontology and, and approach. So while the other one was cultural models was tacit and implicit knowledge. This is um, looking at how knowledge is distributed. Um, and the first point I make here is that it's trying to get away from essentializing culture. You know, that um, I, can't, I can't think of any because they're so stereotypical, you know, but something that's always associated with a particular. Brazilians are great dancers. You know, they've got a really gusto for life and you know they're just full of life and all that well maybe not all of them i don't know uh, we'll talk about that later so it's it's a way to kind of get at the variability within uh cultural behavior practice etc so here culture simply can be seen as a distribution of shared individual cognitions and representations it doesn't go as deep into the cognitive world as cultural models but it's looking at distribution of shared individual cognitions. Its goal is to understand the factors that account for this distribution. So we really want to understand how do we explain the variability in the distribution of knowledge and values. And some of those distributions are driven by human universals, but some are driven by context. And that context can include everything that Eduardo and Paige talked about uh, today. Um, so culture is not something that's very dynamic. It's an emerging phenomenon of shared cognition that evolves out of individual interactions with both the social and physical world. Okay, a little. So what does that look like? Um, so that approach, we can, we can um, use this theory and method called cultural consensus. Um, so cultural consensus describes and measures the extent to which knowledge is shared. I just mentioned that. It has this um, theory and it's an assumption, ontology, I think. It assumes that the correspondence between any two answers is a function of the extent to which each is correlated with some underlying truth or knowledge. So that if Olaf and I answer the same way, the assumption to be tested is whether we are sharing some underlying knowledge. Okay? We may not, which means that we're drawing on two different knowledge systems to answer that question about blue crabs. Um, it's an analytic procedure that we can use to estimate what is the culturally uh, correct answer. Now that's not politically correct to say, but um, I'll explain it in a second. We can actually um, generate, if there's strong consensus, the approach will generate what is the culturally consensus correct answer. A way to think about that is um, if uh, CSYNC, in preparing for this workshop, um, created a, a test for you to take of your knowledge at the, that they wanted you to have at the end of this workshop on anthropology, et cetera, then they would, or we developed the, the anthropologist, and we had a test, so that we would give you the postdocs a test at the end of this workshop, okay? And we would grade it against some answer key that we came up with, right? Okay. The cultural consensus approach says, we would give you that same, they would give you that same test, but we don't have an answer key. The patterns of your responses, from that we will generate the answer key. If there's strong enough agreement that if all of you said um, anthropology is the best, then um, if there was enough pattern agreement, then, um, then we would assume that 
that somehow you're drawing upon some shared underlying knowledge that allowed you to answer that in a way that we feel we've got across to this cultural group. So it's like, it's a, it's a to me, a, quite a great teaching idea that you don't have an answer key to your test at the beginning of the semester. You run your course, then you give, the, you give your test, and you see what the correct answers are. And what is it testing? It says, well, how well did you get these ideas across? So we don't do that for obvious reasons, because uh, our teaching evaluations would go down. Um, OK, I want two other points, and I'll show you what it looks like, is that if we find cultural consensus, it, it doesn't mean universal agreement. There are people who vary from the consensus, and, and we can get an est indicators of that as well. Um, and um, it will actually, as I said before, give us a modeled answer key, which uh, is the cultural consensus of the group. And that way, I think it's quite uh, interesting in that we went from uh, quantitative data to create actually a modeled response, very, very inductively. So um, we did this on um, uh, oyster restoration. We were part of a large environmental impact study. Um, from 2005 to around 2009, um, you, on this EIS, um, the states around the Chesapeake Bay, they, they wanted to explore some alternatives to oyster restoration, um, a very, very interesting experience, one I don't think I'll repeat, but um, lots of different, all, so we, um, that's kind of the background of it. And interestingly, at the core key of this was the question of whether to introduce a non-native species, the Asian oyster, to help. Uh, repopulate, restore the native oyster. Um, we did the standard anthropological things that you've all been learning about, the literature review, interviews, participant observations, we did survey questions, and various types of uh, data analysis and methods. And um, sorry you can't see this as well, we created um, from the interview qualitative cultural modeling work we created survey questions. I mentioned yesterday that we typically create our survey questions after we do our interviewing. So these are statements that came out of the interviews. And I'll read, I'll read both of them so you can pick them up on the screen. The first one is, restoration with native oysters could work given more time and the use of new approaches. And underneath that, you need to rate how strongly you agree or disagree with that. Na restoration with native oysters could work if you give it more time and use some new approaches. So this was a big theme that came out. Or managed oyster sanctuaries and reserves should be a larger part of the oyster fishery in the future. So we've picked up some key themes from our interviews, and we want to rate, ask people to rate their agreement. This is no different than the triadic comparison that I showed before. But this. So it produces um, some quantitative results. And you can see we had these different study groups, and we've combined them. Um, and we, uh, cultural consensus uses factor analysis. Uh, so we, we take the results of the responses to these questions and we see if the responses are patterned in a way that they will uh, load on to different factors in different ways. So, you know, we're, we're trying to see whether there's some underlying dimension to the responses to these questions. My great analogy is if I have a magnet and I pass it through some iron ore filings, and those filings represent the distribution of responses, a bunch of those filings will glom onto the first factor. I shed them off, I pile them up there, and I look at intercorrelations among them, where some of the questions response is highly intercorrelated. I run my magnet through the iron ore filings again. I get some more variance loading on that factor. I have another factor. Okay, so in cultural consensus, we have a theory, a um, working theory, that in order to have cultural consensus, you need to have this value of the eigenvalue, which is the sum of the squared variation, variance. You need to have this column here, these values, the ratio of the first eigenvalue to the second has to be over three. Really, it should be over four. So here we have a... So meaning that four times as much variance loaded on the first factor than the second factor, which means it's not that they all agreed, but there was some underlying pattern in their responses. Okay? And this mean f factor loading is, that, is an indication of how many respondents uh, f 
questions loaded on the first factor. That's the average. So uh, this is high. There's a lot of consensus in their response underneath. You know, we get these high factor loadings and these high eigenvalues. We can talk about that in, in discussion. So what does that allow us to do? I didn't put in here. It allows us to do a couple things. First is it will produce an individual um, uh, factor, uh, factor loading. It'll produce for each individual, it will produce a number like 0.64 indicating uh, the percentage of their questions that loaded on the first factor. So that's a way of sort of quantitatively capturing how much of Olaf's responses were correlated with the responses on the first factor, all of those that responded. So you get a nice sort of quantitative indicator of 64% of your responses are correlated with the cultural consensus questions, the first factor. The second is we can take these model stakeholder responses um, and create that answer key to all the questions. So in the model here, if you take some of these are statements, again, these propositions, uh, do you think we should introduce a non-native oyster in the Chesapeake Bay right now? Watermen say yes, scientists say no, um, environmentalists say no. There was a lot more variability in that data. Watermen were kind of split, depending on that. But the model predicts that based on an underlying culture, they would, the, the, the modeled answer is yes. And ethnographically, that makes sense to me. But if you look at the descriptive frequencies, um, there's variability, a lot of variability. So we can look at the key statements and propositions that seem to make groups similar or dissimilar. And it's a, it's, it again is that modeled answer key that came out of cultural consensus. So why link culture, cognition in the environment? Um, I think it uh, sharpens and refines our understanding of interactions between people and the environment. I don't often, you know, I encourage my students to do cognitive anthropology, but I'm also very happy if they pull up a little short and do just good ethnography. It really sharpens, if, to build these models, qualitatively, quantitatively, you really have to work hard with the data and be very, very careful. Um, I think it produces good ethnographic insights. Um, I believe it, it gives us one look at core and emotive knowledge and values about the environment. Um, I can tell you lots of examples how I think uh, these are like core themes that commercial fishermen have that when you talk with them about managing a fishery, it is always in a room with them. And you know, that's come through our work. And so my, my goal is to kind of dredge that up and make that more explicit in the conversations. We can do the multi-sided and intergroup. You know, we had various stakeholders there. Um, and, it, and it does, um, it can it sort of inductively, it can get at the social, economic, political, environmental factors. It benefits from political ecology. It benefits from broad socio-environmental synthesis and, and the, even the evolutionary ecology uh, work, behavioral ecology work. So I see it as a really um, very focused, hard attempt at doing inductive ethnography win, within and across groups. It's works, it gets even better when it's linked with these other uh, foci in anthropology. Okay, and uh, that's it. Okay, thanks.